Thank you for coming today. My name is Sandra Shuri. I'm the uh, Director for State Health Policy at the California Healthcare Foundation. The foundation is a philanthropy here in California dedicated to uh, improving healthcare delivery and delivery systems. And uh, this is one in a series of policy briefings that we sponsor uh, for the policymaking community in Sacramento, trying to highlight uh, elements of our work that we think are relevant uh, to your work. Today, um, we're going to talk about independent medical review. And I'd like to turn the agenda over to my colleague, Marion Mulkey. Marion is the uh, director of our health reform and public program work. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here today. Uh, the California Healthcare Foundation first looked into California's independent medical review process shortly after it was established, um, over a decade ago. We were drawn to the topic because of its importance for consumers. It really makes a difference to people who uh, reach that point. Um, its role in making concrete what coverage actually means, particularly um, at the periphery where science is just emerging, and its relationship to an important um, and sometimes conflicting set of policy goals around access, patient-directed care, and resource use. Those topics obviously are still very relevant today, um, and the Affordable Care Act and its promise to broadly extend coverage to millions more people makes it even more timely in some ways. Uh, so these deliberations about what it means, what it ought to mean to be covered, um, how contractual obligations, medical practice, and science should be navigated when there's some uncertainty about what exactly is in and out of that coverage uh, pool, um, are all issues that seem very relevant today. Um, we've got just the right group here to talk about uh, these topics. Our agenda is in front of you in your packet, uh, and because we have quite a number of speakers today, I'm going to try to move quickly through our introductions and, and get out of the way and let, and let folks talk. I'm going to ask also, uh, I know this isn't an ideal room for an interactive conversation anyway, but I'm going to ask people uh, to hold their questions to the best of their ability until we get through our speakers. We are planning to have time for questions and answers, and we do hope to do that. Um, but if possible, we'd like to uh, go through the, the uh, presentations first. Um, I'm going to introduce our first set of speakers at, uh, to start with, and then we'll turn over to reactors later, and I'll introduce them as well. I'm not going to go through full bios. Um, they're in your packets. These are all uh, uh, people with great uh, um, backgrounds and uh, experience in this topic, and uh, you can learn more about them by reading the bios. But I want to start with uh, Deborah Kelch of Kelch Associates, who conducted and wrote this report with um, her colleague Anne Louise Coons. Um, the, Deborah's contributions on policy issues uh, related to re health insurance and regulatory oversight are, I think, well known to many of you. Um, but she and Anne brought a thorough and thoughtful approach to this analysis that I think really um, comes through in the report and I know will come through in Deborah's remarks today. After Deborah shares with us a high-level summary of the findings, we're going to hear um, from, uh, from Andrew George, Lynn Gage at the Department of Managed Health Care, and Tony Signorelli at the Depar California Department of Insurance to talk a little bit about the IMR process there. And then following them, um, Jill Yagian, who's a former colleague of mine at the California Healthcare Foundation and now at the American Institutes of Research, is going to offer us a perspective. So we're going to get through that portion of the agenda, and then we'll turn over to short reactor comments and then questions from all of you. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. I see a lot of friendly faces and um, some new um, folks as well. So I really want to say thank you for coming and um, hope we have an interesting conversation today. Um, one thing that, um, just so you know, my thought was that as I'm making my presentation, I have some preliminary comments about the IMR program and then the findings and, and uh, suggestions from the report. I thought it might be helpful to stop my presentation sort of at that early dis, um, beginning of what is um, the overall structure of the IMR program and have both Department of Managed Healthcare and Department of Insurance give you their presentations on their respective programs. We kind of then have this, the full um, appreciation for the programs, and then we'll return to some of the findings we have from the data we looked at and also um, some suggestions we have for areas of improvement going forward. 
So, um, you know, we're really just past 10 years in the IMR program. So I'm going to provide that background. Um, when we, at, diff, um, at a certain point in the process of this project, we wondered whether the um, requirements in the Federal Affordable Care Act around um, independent medical review would have some impact or would create the need for legislative change here in California. So we were looking at that question about the time the Federal Department of Health and Human Services notified California that they felt that our existing program was um, substantially in compliance with the requirements of the federal ACA. So that comes, but we still are highlighting for people's attention some of the um, requirements in the Affordable Care Act. <clears throat> so just briefly, um, the slides that you have really are complete, but I'm not going to really um, review and, and talk about everything here. But just so we, we really had in California some existing voluntary programs that were primarily administered by the health plans, some of whom had quite extensive internal and often external um, scientific and medical um, experts providing them with insight and information around some of the coverage choices, the new technologies, and other things that um, they were confronting in terms of their coverage decisions. And then we initially began in California in state law with a program focused on the experimental and investigational treatments that were emerging and the health plan decisions there. And finally, we came to, in legislation passed in 1999, the current program. So essentially, there are three types of cases, or two and 0.5. Um, there are those um, cases that come as a result of the health plan um, or insurer making a denial or a modification to a coverage decision based on medical necessity. And a subset of those are those instances where there is some question as to the payment for or coverage for urgent and emergency care that in most cases has already happened. And then finally, the experimental and investigational treatment cases. So the um, independent review organization that California has is the same for both Department of Managed Health Care and Department of Insurance. Um, this entity under our state law must um, meet pretty strict requirements around conflicts of interest, as must the reviewers that they bring to um, review the project, re review the cases. <clears throat> so um, we have essentially these two categories, and it's important to talk about them in two separate um, discussions because the review process is different depending on whether it's a medical necessity case or an experimental investigational case. So here's just, and there's a great um, chart in the report um, that talks about how, what those differences are. Um, my colleague Ann Coons put that together as we were doing the work because it really helped to kind of illustrate um, those differences kind of in one easy to sort of access resource. But here, basically, um, there are five criteria in California law, and the decision of the reviewers in those cases can be based on any of those. Um, and there is one reviewer in a medical necessity case. Um, in an experimental and investigational case, there is actually three reviewers, two to three in our review of the data. Um, and here, there are somewhat different criteria in that the um, The standard here would be that the therapy must be likely to be beneficial, more beneficial than standard therapy based on, now, the enrollee's medical condition, documentation that's provided in the file, and, a, and uh, medical and scientific evidence, which in our state law is in some detail listed, including, for example, peer-reviewed medical journals, and specific professional bodies that the reviewers can look to. So let's take just a minute to talk about the Affordable Care Act and what um, is envisioned there. The Affordable Care Act requirements around independent medical review flow from a National Association of Insurance Commissioners model law that is specifically referenced in the Affordable Care Act. 
the new requirements at the federal level will apply both to state regulated health plans, like the ones currently subject to our independent medical review program, but also to self-insured plans that are not subject to state review and are instead subject to federal oversight. The difference being the self-insured plans will be, as in the early days of California's program, the self-insured plans will be contracting with the independent review organization rather than a regulatory body or government agency. So just a couple of high-level um, issues in the NAIC standards. Again, there's very specific inf um, requirements around the notice, the right to appeal. Here, health plans, as in California, pay the cost of IMR. In the federal law, enrollees have four months to appeal. Um, and again, there is similar conflict of interest information, and decisions must be provided within 45 days or in 72 hours in urgent cases. A couple of uh, noticeable difference, California enrollees have six months to appeal to IMR. The decision must come quicker within 30 days, and we have much stronger language in our broad requirements imposed on health plans around translation services than are envisioned in the federal law. And there are some specific differences we'll talk about briefly later about the requirements of the qualifications of reviewers. So let's see what we have, what we found in the data. So we have um, seen a dramatic and steady increase in the number of IMR cases, although they remain a very small percentage relative to the total number of people enrolled in coverage. Here's an overview of some of the most common diagnostic categories that have been going to the IMR process. Here's a number that um, often is a big part of the conversation we have on independent medical review, to what extent the decisions of the health plans are being overturned. And you see, although there are some differences, it's pretty steady. We're um, most recently um, with 46% of the plan decisions um, overturned. There's a much lower rate, or not much lower, but there's a lower rate of reversal for the experimental investigational cases. So as I said, the rate of IMR cases is relatively low. This um, slide reflects a rate that was calculated by the Department of Managed Healthcare using their enrollment data and their um, IMR cases. Unfortunately, we couldn't do that for the CDI cases just because of data differences, but it gives you, I think, a sense since there's a significant number um, of individuals under DMHC coverage. We get a good sense of what the rate of IMRs is. So here's some of the um, high-level top um, uh, categories of service or treatment that are showing up in IMR. Um, you see uh, general surgery. And there's a lot of categories here. And you see nothing. Um, so, so the numbers go down after some. So there's a wide array of. Um, services and treatments that are coming before the IMR reviewers. So at this point, I'd like to stop and ask um, the departments to give you just their kind of more inside view of what happens with IMR when enrollees appeal to the process. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Andrew George, Deputy Director from the Department of Managed Health Care, and uh, we'd like to thank Kelch Associates, Associates and the Foundation for inviting us here uh, to discuss our independent medical review process uh, in conjunction with this briefing. Um, the DMHC, along with our colleagues at CDI, have been administrating the IMR process since its inception in 2001. And uh, independent medical review ha has really proven to be a, a great success. Uh, providing fast, cost-free, and highly effective assistance to consumers who have disputes with their health plans. And uh, while we're very, very proud of our program, you know, we also welcome opportunities such as this one um, to hear ideas about how the process can be improved. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lynn Gage, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about how independent medical review uh, works at the DMHC, and uh, we look forward to your questions later. Thank you. In today's presentation, we are going to discuss how the enrollees access IMR, how we run our process, and we monitor the our process as well as the review organizations, and again, how we're going to identify trends and react to those trends. Um, discussing access, 
awareness to the IMR uh, program is really critical. Um, we require that the health plans uh, include IMR information and their right to IMR, the application and an envelope in the uh, denial letter sent to the enrollee by the health plan. We also uh, go to outreach events and activities, uh, including we work closely with the department, uh, patient advocate, Office of Patient Advocate, and other community-based organizations. And also our website has a lot of uh, valuable information on IMR and they can access the application form. And starting later this year, we will be accepting online applications. If the consumer has difficulty filling out an application, our uh, call center agents at the help center will assist with that. Um, we really wanna get those consumers into the program process and we'll do whatever we can. We take a team approach when uh, qualifying a, a, a case, we call them case, the application comes in and we open up a case file. We, uh, a team consists of an analyst who is responsible for the complete case review and summary and often requires research for critical information missing. Uh, then a nurse looks at the case file and she identifies any uh, clinical issues that need to be addressed with the uh, review organization, the question posed. And she also does some research, requires contacting providers. And if required, an attorney is brought in to look at the case to resolve any coverage or other legal issues. We have challenges in getting the, uh, the case to the review organization. It is our goal always to assist the enrollee to get the best possible outcome with their IMR. But our biggest challenge is obtaining information that was not included in the application, but would be necessary for the physician reviewer to make a determination. Most of our efforts go to finding out-of-network medical records for the review, um, the health plan does not always have the obligation to search for out-of-network records, and so we will put the effort in. We also have to clarify dates of service, and sometimes that can be a big task, and get claims and invoices and receipts if they paid out of pocket or if they paid a copay that was wrong and our nurses are very involved with getting treatment plans. Any complex coverage issues uh, we'll send over for legal analysis to determine whether uh, the denial was whole or in part based on medical necessity. The, once we uh, get a case back from the review organization, um, our compliance manager reviews the documents and the physician's review and determines whether that the physician's selection uh, met the statutory requirements. Uh, the records reviewed were adequate and up to date to make a determination and were the re references and evidence cited by the physician were current and relevant. And then most important, did the re physician reviewer ask, answer the question asked using the correct standards required by law? Um, and then are all the documents free of error, errors? We wanna put out a good product, so that's really important. In implementing the IMR, after that thorough review of documents, the compliance manager prepares a letter advising the enrollee that the DMHC has adopted the determination 
of the review uh, reviewer and that the decision is binding on the plan. The DMHC letter, um, along with a copy of the analysis and determinations of the medical professionals reviewing the case, is then mailed to the enrollee and the treating physician and a fax copy to the health plan. If that decision was an overturn the plans of the plan's denial, the plan is given five days to authorize that service. And we will not close our case until we have confirmation in our case file that that authorization has been provided by the health plan. The, all the um, physician reviews have the same components in it, and this is just an idea of what is included in the review. It is a um, biography of the physician's qualifications, uh, adequacy of the medical records and clinical information, uh, evidence submitted for review, um, and that includes additional evidence cited by the reviewer. Um, to, before they make their determination. Uh, complete analysis and findings, and then of course at the very end is the reviewer's determination. The DMHC um, has a strict oversight of the review, the independent review organization, and we monitor that in various ways. Um, they provide to us a monthly quality review of the cases that they uh, handled for that month. They do take a certain percentage and do a quality review of that and provide us that information. We also ask the review organization to address complaints from consumers and providers utilizing our uh, own quality review process. And in that situation, if there is a complaint, we uh, will send that on to the medical director for the review organization, and they, he will, or she will review the physician's work and determination and decide whether or not there were any deficiencies in that review and respond appropriately to that. Uh, we also work in correcting problems as they arise with the IMRs or the process, and we track those issues and discuss them in our uh, regularly scheduled meetings with uh, our review organization. Uh, so everything, they we work very collaboratively together, and it actually works very well. We work to identify trends and respond to those trends. Um, all our cases are reviewed both individually and collectively, and we try to determine whether or not further action or investigation is warranted. Um, additional scrutiny and tracking is applied to cases to see if there are emerging issues. Science changes over the years, so we have to stay above the the line there and make sure that we're, we're ahead of the plan. We, when a pattern or trend is identified, we can go to um, different processes to uh, track and, and deal with it. That it could include obtaining more comprehensive analysis uh, from the review organization, and that could be in the, as an example, a white paper uh, we bring issues to the attention of the involved health plans, and we also coordinate with other DMHC units, such as the Division of Plan Surveys or the Office of Enforcement to address issues. This slide, it looks kind of busy, but really what I want to highlight on it is, as you can see in our three-year comparison, we're staying, staying fairly constant in our number of IMRs. Um, the preliminary data for 2011 shows that we have 1,770 um, IMRs and that the majority of our IMR cases are related to decisions uh, of medical necessity. 
what for this slide we uh, combined the reversal cases with the overturns. Now a reversal case is that cases that the plan reversed their denial after the enrollee filed an independent medical review with the department. We believe that the plan would not have reversed their decision if we were not involved. So by combining the two reversals with the strict overturns, you can see on a medical necessity for 2011, 61% of the cases sent to the IMR for IMR resolution uh, were overturned in the consumer's favor. And we believe this is a great program for our California consumers. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, Tony Signorelli from the, the California Department of Insurance. Thank you, good morning. I'm Tony Signorelli, Deputy Commissioner for Consumer Services and Market Conduct with the Department of Insurance. In the interest of time, I will uh, be very more general in, on some of the areas that we uh, have the similar or same process with the DMHC and in essence the same topics policyholder access to IMR how CDI processes IMRs monitoring the IMR process and the IRO and identifying and addressing trends similar to DMHC you know access to the IMR is very important uh, some of the avenues where consumers and patients can gain that access is through the statutory requirements with regard to documentation such as EOBs, denials, uh, dis other disclosures of, of the IMR process, and outreach to uh, provider groups, to consumer groups, and, com consumer and com community based organizations. In addition, CDI does also has a uh, website that provides the application form and instructions on the D and on the CDI's website. We also will assist the consumer or, or the provider through our call center in filing that IMR, or we will also get information from just the standard handling of a complaint. Um, and if that rises to the threshold of an IMR, we'll then turn that into an IMR. The qualification process is pretty a matter of fact. Our compliance officer staff will review the information, make sure it complies with the, the eligibility requirements, and if necessary, get involved with one of our attorneys with the department to review issues, um, coverage, certain coverage issues and other legal issues. One difference I'll note is the department does not have on staff uh, healthcare professionals such as nurses. Likewise, with DMHC, the greatest challenge is probably the lack of documentation with regard to what were provided um, by the provider or the patient. That could really speed things up if on the front end of this there's more documentation. I know that's not always easy, but it, obviously that would speed things up. Lack of detailed treatment plans is important in, in many of the conditions and treatments that we're involved in looking at. Complex coverage disputes are, are real, have become a, a major issue in the last year or so where insurance companies um, may, instead of calling something a denial for medical necessity, may call it something else. Um, whether that's an attempt to uh, avoid the IMR process or whether that's, uh, there's other reasons, but they may just deny it for uh, coverage exclusions. And then the department will have to then analyze that and say, is this really a strictly a coverage issue or should this go to IMR for a binding decision? Implementing the, the IMR is similar to the DMHC in that once we get the decision, we'll send letters out to the policyholder, the provider, and the insurance company adopting the IRO decision and advising them that it is binding. And likewise, if it's overturned, we ask the insurer to take immediate steps to implement the decision, whether that's 
authorizing the treatment or reimbursing the already paid for treatment and reporting back to the CDI when the action is taken. Um, and we will also keep the file open pending that resolution. In monitoring the IMR process and identifying trends, uh, we review both our internal processes um, to, as best as possible, have our processes not slow down the IMR process at any of those stages, uh, as well as look at the, pr the timelines for the IRO process to see if there's any room for, for speeding that up. We also review the cases by diagnosis, treatment, by insurance company, and other issues for potential trends. And if we identify trends, we'll determine the appropriate course of action, and that could be a referral to our market conduct area, to our legal area, and, and some, other, some other actions. In general, our, our, I'll close, our three-year trend is very similar to the DMHCs. Uh, I did not include the reversals, though, and it's similar to the report that was just presented with regard to about a 45% uh, overturn rate. Thank you. Well, thanks very much to the departments. Um, this is also an opportunity for me to thank them. Uh, both of the departments were very helpful to us in this report, and in both making data available for the report, but also, um, to their credit, um, Department of Managed Healthcare has had for some time uh, a robust database and summaries. CDI has currently put, uh, continuing to improve its information on its website and is um, in the process, I understand, of also bringing for all of us summaries on the cases, which I think will be really important as we go forward. So I'd just like to thank both departments for um, working with us and um, helping us to do this analysis. So, so basically, I think the conclusion that we must draw about our California IMR uh, program is that it is basically meeting the statutory intent. Um, the data reveals that the data we looked at shows that really um, critical healthcare decisions are being made in complicated medical cases. Um, you've seen the data um, noting the Department of Managed Healthcare adding the overturn um, and the reversal cases that we have somewhere around potentially a 60% reversal um, in the or decisions in the consumer's favor. We have seen IMRs grow over time since the program began. And one thing we looked at to see if it was an issue, and it turned out not to be, basically when you look at the who the enrollees are data that we obtained through the two departments, you know, what you see in terms of gender, geography, age, really seems to be pretty much a good reflection of um, enrollees in the state. The other, I think, and this is an area for all of us to continue to look at, and I, I think the department's really noted that it becomes an opportunity for us to see what's really um, developing in the medical consensus. It's really um, sort of impossible to know to what extent IMR is reflecting the changes in the medical consensus and to what extent it may be impacting um, the medical consensus that's emerging. It's probably some of both as we go for some of these um, interesting cases. We looked at a couple that might be just worth kind of illustrating this point. So um, specifically on the issue of bariatric surgery, we see that when it became uh, more readily available and um, there were more physicians to perform the surgery, there was a, what you might describe as a spike in IMR cases as both the health plans and to some extent the medical community was trying to kind of resolve who are the best candidate, what, what patients should be receiving this treatment. Um, there was a lot of um, uh, sort of I wouldn't say experimentation, but there was a lot of, you know, trying to think about, is it reasonable to ask a person to lose weight, et cetera. So there was a lot of um, uncertainty in the medical community. This shows up in IMR. And then in um, 2003, Department of Managed Healthcare brought together the health plans and some bariatric surgeons to talk through the issues that were emerging in IMR. And then you see um, both as a result most likely of those um, the meeting, but also as we now have much um, more clear guidelines that are recognized in the medical community about the best candidates, the best types of surgeries, um, the best conditions and facilities to perform those, so you see the IMR cases dropping. So here's another example. This is the instance of uh, Botox injections for the treatment of migraines. You see the evolution, a lot of cases showing up 
an increasing, and in the late 2010, the FDA approved Botox injections for uh, migraines. So we would expect, we didn't ha we're not looking at that data yet, but you would expect that those cases will eventually um, reduce in the IMR process. So <clears throat> what are some of the challenges? I think the department's highlighted some important ones. Um, in addition, in our look at the data, we, we feel like there, it, it's hard to know to what extent this is about the emerging medical evidence, but some, it did seem like in some cases, sort of at the same time, similar patients seeking the same treatment might get different results. Um, one thing that is a challenge for all of us and doesn't really reflect on the program and I think uh, perhaps um, Lynn was um, sort of suggesting this, um, and that is what type of case it is is to some extent determined by the, what the health plan says about we're denying this because we think it's not medically necessary or we're denying it because of the provision in our contract around experimental. And two different health plans might refer to similar cases to, for different reasons. In other words, one might turn it down as experimental, one might say it's not medically necessary. But what that means for enrollees is two people sort of about trying to get the same treatment for a similar condition may have two different processes depending on what the health plans do. And I think that's something that we can all continue to talk about. Um, the other thing just to mention is, um, although we have um, a good amount of public data, I think as the program goes forward, there's opportunities to make that better. And so some of the things um, we would like to see include, you know, improving the documentation of what are the reasons that the medical reviewers are giving and maybe connecting those back to the five um, criteria in state law. Um, and it, it seemed like um, in some of the data we got, and it, it appears there may be additional information we could all look at going forward. But just matching up the reviewer qualifications with the cases they're reviewing and making sure that to the extent that's possible, we can do that. Why is it not? There we go. Um, so just looking at the data, I'll, I'll let you look at this, and it's, there's a lot more in the report. But we just what we did was take the summaries that are available, which is our primary and only source on this issue, and really look at you know, what are the reviewers stating. And I think there's some room for additional conversation, and I, I think maybe some of our um, reactors will help us initiate that conversation on how we can get a better handle on what the reasons that, that are being cited are. I guess I'm supposed to go that way. Um, so what are the areas for improvement? And most notably, I think it's this continuing opportunity for all of us to keep talking about the data that we're making available, the ways it's made available. Um, and then that provides um, an enhanced opportunity for all of us, including the regulators, to do increased monitoring and oversight. And here, this idea of how the referrals happen, whether something goes to experimental um, review or in, uh, medical necessity review, I think those are just good opportunities and, and available to California because we, ha we got out with this program early. We have a significant uh, track record of, of cases and data and, and two departments that we can work with to um, go forward and even make it better and get even better opportunities to oversee the program. <clears throat> so um, basically, um, we would like to see that um, those changes happen going forward in terms of being able to look at uh, additional data um, in the public forum so that we can all kind of continue to monitor the program. And with that, um, I'll turn it back to Marion. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, and we've asked uh, Jill Yegian now to provide a perspective um, from a little bit broader viewpoint on um, what this California uh, process might mean for um, our thinking about uh, uh, the use of uh, medical care and the impact on consumers more generally. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, I'm Jill Yagian from American Institutes for Research. Uh, we are a uh, large social sciences research organization based in Washington, D.C., uh, but with a local office, sort of local, in uh, San Mateo. And it's really a pleasure uh, to be here and to see people, so many people interested in, 
independent medical review. Um, and I was asked to just sort of bring in a slightly broader perspective um, and thought that I would use that to pose a bit of a broader question about the standard of evidence um, that is uh, brought to bear in IMR in California. So what I was hoping to do was just um, spend a second on the report's recommendations and then go through the findings related to the current status uh, with respect to evidence in IMR, and then talk a little bit about what the rationale and challenges might be with the stronger standard. Deborah's already talked uh, about her report recommendations, so I won't go back over that. I would say that I think the report is just a terrific contribution, uh, clear and comprehensive. And this takes a really complex and challenging area that is um, uh, can be can feel impenetrable and I thought she laid it out beautifully and captures a tremendous amount of information in a clear and coherent way that can really help people uh, engage in this con in this conversation so one of the things that Deborah goes into is this question of uh, the whether it makes sense to think about the level of uh, existing oversight of and compliance with the current standards for both reviewer qualifications and decision-making rationale. And so um, I am not um, uh, revisiting that question, but rather using the report as a jumping off point to ask the question, are those standards uh, where they ought to be and where we want them to be for California? And beginning with the uh, thinking about the reviewer standards, I think that the um, California IMR requirement is that the reviewer be knowledgeable about the condition and familiar with the guidelines and the protocols for treatment. Uh, and the NAIC model law that Deborah referred to has a more stringent standard that refers to the reviewer being expert in the treatment of the condition and knowledgeable about the recommended healthcare service or treatment through recent or current actual clinical experience treating patients with the same or similar medical conditions. So um, the question, again, is not compliance with the current standards, but rather which set of standards are most appropriate to have in place for the program in California. And likewise, when we think about the issue of the decision-making standards uh, in California's IMR program, and here it is important to make that distinction between medical necessity and investigational experimental because they are on different tracks, the medical necessity uh, standard is any of the following, peer-reviewed evidence, national standards, expert opinion, generally accepted standards, or the services likely to provide a benefit when other services are not efficacious. So that is in contrast to the NAIC model law, most appropriate practice guidelines, which must include evidence-based standards. So the question here is, is, is it worth considering strengthening the standards in California's IMR requirements to more specifically require reference to medical evidence of effectiveness? We can see, and, and I really liked Deborah's pie that had a blank uh, in it where, uh, where there was no reason uh, given. This chart had a high level is showing that 46% of the time, again, that's given the limitations of available evidence, uh, available data about the existing um, IMR caseload, that 46% of the time the reviewers uh, cited only common practice and another 12% of the time cited no reason at all. Again, the question not being that common practice is absolutely acceptable as uh, the reason for a decision under California's IMR. And the question is, is, uh, is that where we want to be? So what might be the rationale for a stronger standard of effectiveness in, in California's IMR program? Well, one uh, reason to give that some consideration is that common practice doesn't mean it works. And I think we are gaining an increasing acquaintance with that notion. Um, Certainly, there are many uh, conditions for which they work in some populations and are clearly shown to be ineffective in others. And, and I'm no clinician, um, but one example where I think uh, there is some pretty clear medical evidence about this is in arthroscopic surgery uh, of the knee 
which can be a very effective procedure, but has been pretty clearly demonstrated to not be particularly effective for osteoarthritis. And yet hundreds of thousands of cases uh, are done each year. And so then the question becomes, when you think about patient protection, every therapy carries risk. You think about the cost of ineffective services. Uh, does it make sense to really make the more stringent criteria that refers to the level of effectiveness? Another reason to really give that some thought is that there is an increasing availability of evidence. We have this um, amazing investment that has been made in recent years and is continuing to be made in the development of evidence and uh, guidelines for clinical care. So we have, you know, for a long time, we've had the Agency for Healthcare Research and its Effective Healthcare Program doing systematic reviews and evidence generation. We have the new Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which will be when it's up and running in the billions. Uh, we have specialty societies like the American College of Cardiology uh, who take very seriously their charge to translate uh, new medical evidence into guidelines for how uh, their clinical specialty should be treating patients. Uh, and so isn't it incumbent um, upon us to make reference to that growing body of evidence of the effectiveness of medical care? So what are challenges with these stronger standards? Well, just the volume of the new information coming out can, can be really overwhelming. And, and I heard a recent presentation, and I haven't had a chance to fact check this, but that uh, annually there are around a million uh, articles that come out that have something to do with uh, new medical evidence. And the quality of that evidence can really vary. And uh, much of the time, when you look at what the evidence-based practice centers that are funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, they can go through a very rigorous systematic review process of looking at all the medical evidence on a specific question and come out with a report that is essentially telling us, gee, we don't really know. And I think that's a real challenge when it comes to trying to institute stronger uh, effectiveness uh, standards. There's also often lack of definitive guidance on subgroups so that you may know uh, that something works generally, um, but you may really want to know about a particular subgroup of patients or a particular delivery setting or what happens in the real world as to compared to a randomized uh, controlled trial. And then the point that Deborah made as well, IMR may be much more prevalent and really relevant when the evidence is less available. So there's a little bit of a catch-22 potentially there. This is just to make the point, you know, that uh, there is no right answer, that people are going to have different perspectives that they bring to this question about what the right evidence standard is. Um, and in conclusion, I think it is worth thinking about whether the standard is strong enough for California's IMR program. California is a leader in this area uh, nationally, and a lot of states will be looking to California with respect to their experience and standards and IMR programs. Um, and should we require reference to medical evidence in those standards? The questions, I think, are, uh, well, there are many, but a couple of them are really what standard of evidence is it realistic to expect from reviewers in the IMR process? Uh, and also, you know, to what extent is credible medical evidence available to IMR reviewers at the time that they're making decisions? It would be very interesting to look at a subset of the decisions made and really sort of follow that through to say what was available at the time this decision was made and to what extent did the reviewers really take into, uh, into account the available medical evidence at the point of decision making. Um, and I think is, as, as useful and insightful as Deborah's report was, it, that question was really outside its scope uh, and, and would be, uh, would be uh, as researchers like to say, a topic for future research. <laughs> so on that note, I will turn it over. Thank you so much, Jill. So we um, are going to turn now to um, a re reactor panel, um, some additional perspectives on California's process. And we are really fortunate uh, to have with us three people who have thought about this issue, I think it's fair to say, for many years, individually and collectively. Uh, and they have, I think, that historical perspective to bring to bear. But what we are, um, I think, 
uh, even more interested in hearing is their um, thoughts and reaction based on the analysis that we've heard, the discussion of the process that we've heard, and some of the questions that we've heard posed about um, not uh, both how this is working now and whether there are uh, uh, directions in the future that might bear further discussion and further review. So I'm going to ask um, Beth Capel of Health Access to start, and she'll be followed by Patrick Johnson of the California Association of Health Plans and Carol Lee of the California Medical Association Foundation. Thank you for the opportunity to review the report and thanks for I'm sorry, I'm not used to <laughs> Beth Capel, uh, Health Access was involved in the development of the legislation that led to IMR and to, I was lucky enough to have the assignment of working on this issue for four, the four or five years that it took us to develop the law that exists in California. Um, I would say that there were things that we hoped for that this report reflects have been realized, that IMR was intended to get people the care they needed in a timely manner. It was intended that the results would evolve as the science evolved. And we would note that the standards were developed with the recognition that most healthcare lacks a basis in evidence, um, which is something that's quite surprising to most people. But um, the move towards more evidence-based care is one we support. But we also recognize that most care does not meet that standard at that, this, that standard. It was intended to be independent. That is, some of the earlier efforts had the HMO or insurer paying the reviewer, and this did not seem to us to uh, assure a reliable result. And it was also intended to resolve the many problems in healthcare that are not worth litigating over. Do I need a surgery? Do I need a medicine? What kind of care? What's the appropriate kind of care for my condition? And finally, I would note that it was intended to be specific to the individual patient. So that if, for example, a kind of knee surgery is not appropriate for a particular condition, the reviewer should take note of that and not approve it. So in looking at the report, there are a number of things that are troublesome to from Health Access's perspective about IMR as it currently operates in California. And I think the first one, which Deborah has already noted, is the very low rate of utilization. We have something like 24 million people who have had access to IMR for over a decade, and yet we're running, I don't know, one, less than 1% 1 of people taking advantage of it. This actually less than one-tenth of 1%. And even if you think it's the 20% of the people who use 80% of the care, it's still only a fraction of them who've taken advantage of it. And I'm not sure what the answer is on that, but it seems um, remarkably low to us. We are also troubled by how the decision is made to refer to IMR, and there are um, the, one of the areas that's troubling to us is that the Department of Insurance lacks qualified health professionals. It's in order to review these cases. This was always intended to resolve clinical problems, and it should be health professionals who are looking at it, and we think the Department of Managed Healthcare has gotten that right. On the other hand, and this was not discussed in Deborah's report, we had a whole series of cases involving autism where the Department of Managed Healthcare at one time referred them to, to IMR and then decided that they weren't appropriate for review. And this raised serious questions for us about the whole how cases get sorted and on what basis and whether we need a change in statute or a change in procedure in order to address those. The law is very clear. It says in whole or in part, and it should not rest on the insurer or health plan's decision to characterize the, the decision. If there's any indication that medical necessity was involved, the regulator should have the authority to refer to IMR. I think we're also, one of the things we had hoped for that is partially realized but not fully is to create, in a sense, a, we called it a case law mechanism that the, that all, all of the parties, the plans, the health professionals, consumers, could understand from the case summaries what the decision was and what its implications were so that a, behavior could be adjusted accordingly. And I think in um, 
reviewing the uh, report and, and some back and forth, that this is about the lack of data in the case summaries on the basis for the decision. And it's not as clear that it's actually um, what, how, what evidence the reviewers used for the decision, but it's, it's an important piece to improve on as we go forward. Final point, my understanding was that multiple reviewers could be used for independent medical IMR cases, and that in more complex cases that would be the case, so I hope that there are, that is correct. Thank you, Department of Managed Healthcare is saying I'm correct on that, so. Um, and obviously in simpler cases, a single reviewer should be sufficient. We didn't, never objected to that. So it's, you know, if you spend five years fighting over an issue and a program operates for 10 years, it's sort of nice to see how it's doing. And so we appreciate the opportunity um, to see how it's doing and that it did many of the things we hoped for, but there is room for improvement. Thanks, Beth. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, <clears throat> both for including health plans perspective and for doing the study and assembling uh, this uh, 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 clearly uh, smart group of people, including those in the audience. Um, uh, independent Medical Review uh, is a success story. Uh, prior to its establishment, uh, there were uh, individual conflicts, to be sure, uh, that often weren't resolved with uh, satisfactory results, uh, perhaps for patients, perhaps for health plans. Uh, patients, though, should count on a review of a dispute that uh, is independent of the uh, economic self-interest of the payer. And so what managed care brings to California is a alternative to a fee-for-service system where um, money flows to procedures. The more procedures, the more money. Um, managed care runs the risk, of course, that uh, on a capitated basis, um, if you don't deliver services, you can make more money. So that sort of inherent tension that exists in our healthcare system uh, comes to bear uh, on these very difficult cases, uh, experimental cases, but also uh, ones with uh, questions of medical necessity. And the IMR process is a rational, thoughtful, organized, uh, structured way for California to address those, and it has done so. Uh, so what we're doing today is reviewing it and saying that, um, uh, you know, constant improvement and uh, reflection uh, ought to be always our goal. And in that context, uh, the study is helpful. Um, it points out, for instance, that coverage decisions are different from questions of medical necessity or experimental treatment, and it's been alluded to by, by others. Uh, coverage decisions do matter, however, uh, because um, <clears throat> it's possible to purchase uh, a health plan coverage uh, without uh, pharmacy. So if you don't have drug coverage, saying that drugs are a medical necessity may be true, but nevertheless not in the contract. So you can change the law, and in fact, the essential health benefits um, requirement by the federal government effectively is going to do that. Um, but it, it, it ought not to be the case that everything that is deemed by a licensed health care provider as medically necessary for an individual, whether in a network or out of a network of a health plan, ought to therefore rise to the level of having a review by an independent medical provider um, if, in fact, there is uh, no coverage to begin with. So those issues matter. And <clears throat> while um, the law is clear and, and the uh, departments uh, wrestle with that, and in our judgment, sometimes send things directly to uh, IMR that really ought to be resolved as a coverage matter. Um, the larger political context and debate ongoing over essential health benefits right today and just last week at the Health Benefit Exchange um, sees uh, advocates arguing that if something is medically necessary in the judgment of a health care provider, presumably, um, with or without 
a standard to judge the efficacy of that care, uh, as referenced by Beth, that it still ought to be covered, that it's part of the essential benefits. So that is a slippery slope that whatever its merits, that is, all care at all times from all providers, will be extraordinarily expensive, whether it's the government paying for it or not. <laughs> no, uh, um, Beth, the, Beth, the only thing I'm referring to your statement was as to whether or not the treatment can be demonstrably proven to be efficacious. Did I misstate you? We, are, we accept that IMR results in some people being denied treatment that was recommended by physicians because it's not appropriate treatment. And so I think the notion that health access has ever supported all care at all times for all people. Oh, no, no, yeah. no, no, no. I stipulate I didn't say that. Um, but um, what I'm trying to demonstrate is that coverage matters. And if you don't think about coverage, you're not thinking about cost. Uh, the other thing is that if we are to have what all I think hope for in developing this uh, process uh, and a law which I voted for uh, and, and was involved in as well, uh, it is that, is that you would develop patterns and consistency and that um, that would uh, assist everyone, but certainly health plans, to not deny care where uh, clearly the evidence and the decision-making, which probably accounts for the reversals, uh, when plans look at it, say that this is going to be approved and <clears throat> the science has moved. So it's, it's a constant tension of developing enough data to see what are the patterns and then, um, as indicated, it's an individual decision and in individual cases it may be the appropriate treatment or not. Um, and the science uh, changes. But to do that, the standards indeed ought to be high. They ought to be high for the reviewers as to who's qualified, and they ought to be presumably high as to what the basis for the determination is. And so if half the cases are on common practice, um, as indicated in, in, in Jill's presentation, that does raise the question whether or not it's efficacious or not. So um, <clears throat> I think this process and this review is really helpful, and I would hope that uh, under the auspices of the California Healthcare Foundation, a uh, reputable and neutral site for all parties uh, to debate issues, uh, we could continue uh, looking at uh, both the IMR process and then some of these larger questions that have to do with standards and have also to do with how we're going to balance the cost of care uh, with the need for quality care. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, Carol. Well, this is great. We have the reactor panel reacting to each other, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> you chose the right people. Uh, I, I mean, this program has been a success, and uh, uh, back in the early 90s when the uh, debate started around the, just the experimental investigational treatment, it was based upon a lawsuit that uh, it, uh, it was experimental treatment for breast cancer, $42 million uh, judgment. And the medical association felt, hey, this isn't the way to practice medicine. Uh, we have limited health care dollars. That's not the way to spend them. It's not right to put the patient, uh, their family, and the, the medical practitioners through a process like this. We need a, we need a better process. And to me, it's amazing to, to look back on it, how little the law changed. I mean, the great thing about it was that it was it was made vastly broader uh, in the in the late 90s to to uh, cover a lot more procedures but the the basic process has has worked um, I have several comments uh, uh, of both in the report and uh, my you know comments by my my colleagues uh, I think one of the most important things is the credibility of the program if it's not credible uh, patients are going to ignore it, and I don't think that that's really one of the reasons why um, 
the participation is so low, uh, and that's something I think we need. We definitely need to explore how uh, you know you know how effective our awareness programs are. I'm curious whether there have been some surveys uh, uh, asking the general public, "Are you aware of this process?" I think I'm going to try to do some surveys of physicians. I think we'd be really stunned how few physicians know this actually exists. I noticed when the Department of Managed Care was uh, uh, testifying that they, they had some great programs they talked about for awareness of uh, the consumers. I didn't see any there for providers. And I think a lot of patients will not uh, take advantage of this appeals process unless their physician says something. They really listen to their physicians. And I realize there's been a lot of controversy about how, how qualified the reviewers are, and I think some of the information in the summaries wasn't quite correct. But I can tell you, if a physician was to look at a summary and saw a urologist was making a decision on TMJ, they would say, I don't think I trust this process. Um, that is so key. Uh, at, at the CMA Foundation, we do quite a few provider toolkits. And as I tell my staff, the most important thing we can do is get as many physician experts and thought leaders on, on the advisory panel that comes up with the toolkits because their colleagues will look who was involved in this. So this is going to be a key issue for physicians on how, how much they'll refer and, and push their patients is if they feel there's expert physicians. Uh, I, I don't think knowledgeable do, does go far enough. I actually think uh, we should think about legislation in that, that area that as much as possible we should try to have experts in that area reviewing the decision. I mean, that's what will create credibility with, with physicians. Uh, one of the things that I, I would like to actually see, and again, I, I guess the governor wouldn't be happy because I'm suggesting another board, but um, <laughs> I, I think there should be some sort of an advisory board. There's nothing like having somebody look over your shoulder to uh, make sure you're you know, dotting the I's, crossing the T's. And I'd like to see an advisory board of, of cons you know, well-known consumer groups, physician groups that are looking um, at this maybe on an annual basis. I mean, they don't have to meet, you know, every week or whatever, but on an annual basis, kind of a mini review like this. Uh, and that will make a big difference. I can tell you if a physician sees that the, you know, the California chapter of cardiology uh, or consumer union health access is on an advisory committee overlooking this, that, that sort of thing makes a difference. And so I'd really uh, suggest we, we um, take a look at that. I also think that we, we need to have more detailed uh, public summaries so that uh, both uh, physicians and patients uh, have a, a better grasp about what the case was about, who was reviewing it. And I guess if the, the reviewers overturn it, I'm not quite as concerned about the re reasons, but if they deny it, and again, I think it goes so much to the credibility with the public, they really ought to state the reasons why they deny something. I, I, you know, if we want to try to, to you know, save time and expenses, maybe if they overturn it, I'm not as concerned that they be as detailed. Maybe the health plans will, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but but I mean, for the credibility, I think the patients and physicians, when it's denied, you really do need to be to to be specific. Um, and again, uh, it, I, I found Jill's comments real, really interesting, and I, I was kind of surprised a higher, you know, suggesting a higher standard of review. I mean, this is what this was all about: is that uh, when something's investigational and experimental, particularly, there, there is no evidence. Uh, uh, it's all new stuff, and and that's why we see less um, uh, reviews as as we develop these standards. And I think one of the the fascinating things that uh, I've seen through just our toolkits is when we get into issues where there isn't consensus, is the discussion. And that's probably the final point I'd like to bring up is, uh, and I didn't really see it in the, in the report, is whether, whether there's multiple reviewers, and I think that that's a good idea, particularly um, 
uh, in bigger cases, investigational, experimental, because there's a difference of opinion. And it, I have just witnessed dozens of these discussions where physicians are disagreeing uh, on types of treatment and standards. And it is fascinating, this type of discussion. So, and I'm not sure much of that goes on during the review process. I think now a lot of it's by email. And that's, that's that if there is discussions by email, that's, that's good. But I, I suspect sometimes there's not even really much of a discussion even in writing, but you get these physicians on the phone and they start talking and they, 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 they really kind of egg each other on. What about this? What about that? And it, it really um, it give, just puts a lot more meat on the bone in, in, in making these decisions because sometimes we're talking about literally people's lives. I mean, this, this is important issues. So I, um, I, one, I, I, I don't think that the state you know, sometimes it is common practice or maybe uncommon practice where it's something new going on. And, and I think we're going to have conflicting decisions. Uh, I know the, uh, the, the authors of the report were somewhat concerned about the inconsistency uh, in, in some of these new procedures, but I think we're going to see that. We're going to see, uh, for example, with the Botox or bariatric surgery that in the beginning, we'll just have inconsistent decisions because experts are going to differ. But we're having this debate, and the experts are having a debate, and I think that that, that is a really good thing. Um, in conclusion, I just, um, you know, you, you're involved in so many pieces of legislation, and so many of them turn out to be duds. <laughs> they need to be repealed <laughs> or totally amended. And we got it right. And I think that is just great. And I, I commend uh, both the departments by, for showing such you know, due diligence in carrying out the law. Uh, the report was wonderful. And I feel it's a real privilege to be here and comment on it. It, it really is wonderful to see such an appetite among all the people involved here, the departments who are doing this work, the policy staff that uh, continue to be interested in this topic, the um, plans and healthcare providers and, and consumer representatives who are um, really engaged in this, concerned about it, rolling up their sleeves to see how it's going and, and see if there are ways to make it better. So I want to thank you all for that. Um, we're going to invite anybody from the audience who has a comment or question to come up, but before you start all fleeing for the doors, let me remind you that as is our custom at CHCF, we have um, an evaluation form and we really do value your feedback and would appreciate your comments um, out at the table. And Danny Sandoval has a microphone. If anybody is interested in sharing a comment or question, please uh, raise your hand, speak up. I was interested uh, in quantifiable costs and benefits, which I didn't see in the report. By costs, I mean how much does it cost to administer each case by the departments, uh, including both staff time and the contract with the uh, IMR, uh, IRO. And in terms of uh, benefits, I'm thinking, uh, what was the cost of the services for which the denials were upheld? Uh, were there lawsuits prevented? There is no cost to the consumer whatsoever for IMR. Uh, it's a free service. The, the expense for it is uh, provided, paid for by the health plans. And that cost varies on whether it is an experimental investigational IMR or under medical necessity. And, and thus, break that down, it's more expensive for an expedited review, a review that we're going to complete in a very short time period versus a 30-day standard review. It's tough to quantify, you know, what, what, what the cost is in terms of, um, you know, preventing litigation, et cetera. Um, but again, suffice to say, again, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the, the great final step in the administrative grievance resolution process to have those enrollees, again, who are prevailing at somewhere better than 50 percent, um, to get their health care provided um, through that means, means of dispute resolution. Um, even though, you know, I, I'm not aware of any numbers quant quantifying exactly what that benefit is. Um, you know, we, we believe it's obviously a significant one. Consumers could still sue if they weren't satisfied with the results, which is why it's real. It actually creates a mechanism to, to 
uh, assure the integrity of the process. So if, if routinely people thought the reviewers were not qualified, then you know that would create an incentive for litigation. Uh, we do think that you know the the goal here was to get people they the care they need when they needed it, and not to get them care they didn't need. And so we think in that sense it's created an appellate mechanism f that's focused on the clinical issues, and that's been very important. I was just wondering, and um, Patrick Johnson had. Uh, mentioned the essential health benefits package um, and just kind of looking forward um, thinking that you know we probably don't want a lot of separate kind of evidence-based uh, medical necessity standards here in California when um, the feds may be coming up with kind of their own set of evidence-based um, standards um, and I was just wondering how you kind of see uh, the state's independent independent medical review program kind of interacting with what may be a separate kind of federal um, independent medical review program under the essential health benefits package. But perhaps you're getting to this issue of the federal government giving states the discretion to define essential health benefits for at the state level. And um, I think we're all going to be talking about what that definition means. The federal guidance that's come out so far doesn't really give us perhaps the richness of detail as to what we would be doing in the process. So for example, we have benchmark plans being um, described to us as the choices that the state has. And then the questions, and the state of California submitted comments, and many folks here did as well, sort of asking the question, um, how much of that benchmark plan would we, in fact, be embracing? So does it go to the issues of the exclusions and limitations that are detailed in that particular product and the definition of medical necessity used by that particular carrier, et cetera? So we don't, I don't think we know the answer, but I think your point is well taken that the IMR process will be a companion to us as we go forward and, and an opportunity to kind of look at how essential health benefits rolls forward once we get to knowing what the criteria will be for the state and making that decision. Our me independent medical review process has been used to allow evolution in the definite uh, in what constitutes medically necessary care and that part of what we anticipate is that that will continue and be more robust going forward. It's part of the reason why the recommendations regarding more um, adequate case summaries, better data are really very important going forward so that we can build on this 10 years of experience and help to update what constitutes medically necessary care in a more uh, timely and effective way. I want to thank um, all of our panelists and Deborah Kelch and all of you for being here. It was a really interesting session and um, just again a great uh, a great array of viewpoints and perspectives. Thank you.